everyone. It's Dr. Tofai. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today is, what day is today? January 11th, 2022. Many of you are joining us live via whatever you're watching, whether it's Facebook Live or through Zoom. Um, today's going to be an interesting session because we're dealing with so much. I want to share with you what's going on in my surgical life, uh, which may be affecting you all as well. Um, just as an intro, my name is Dr. Sharon Tofai. You know me as your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Thanks for joining me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. Many of you are here on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai. And you can watch this and our and all past episodes of Hernia Talk Live Q&A on my YouTube channel. So what's going on? I will like to tell you that I had a bunch of operations scheduled for this week at the hospital. Um, I operate both at the hospital and at the hospital owned surgery center, which is an outpatient surgery center. And there are different reasons why I would choose one versus the other. And they canceled all my operations. So I had a bunch of patients that were scheduled, many of them doctors, many of them doctors at that work at the hospital at Cedar sinai and because of various issues related to the current COVID pandemic, all my operations got canceled. And this is something we're seeing throughout the nation and possibly throughout the world. So currently in the year 2022, we are dealing still with the COVID pandemic, but it's a little bit different than last year. Last year, around this time, we also had a lot of, of cancellations Surgery center, um, sorry, uh, uh, hospitals were just overwhelmed with patients. The ICUs were overwhelmed. There was overflow of very sick patients, very ill, that required uh, acute care, and there just wasn't enough room in the hospital to handle the normal volume of patients with different diseases, cancer, heart disease, transplants, surgeries, as well as the overwhelming population of patients with COVID uh, uh, infections. So that was last year this time. And prior to that, it was even worse because not only were the patients super sick, but we had no treatment at all available, uh, including for the doctors who were taking care of these patients. So we had a lot, a lot of deaths, just really horrible deaths. And it'll be very, very tolling on the, on the nurses and the doctors and the caretakers because patients were dying of infections that we couldn't really treat very well. And yet you were putting your life at risk uh, to treat these patients at the same time. And it was very, very sad because their loved ones could not be next to them because they would also get sick. And so many people were dying alone. That is not the current situation, fortunately. We've learned a lot in the past year and a half. Uh, we do have multiple highly effective vaccinations that prevent you from being so sick and needing to be hospitalized or even dying. And even though we keep having different variants, which is the natural thing that happens with any bacteria or virus, um, the situation is different now. So this year, we have vaccinations in the United States, about two thirds of people are fully vaccinated and about four out of five patients or people are at least partially vaccinated. And I believe about a fifth of the of people have received their third dose as a booster. So that's a good thing, which means that even though we have the virus hanging around, people are not ending up in the hospital super sick. That said, they're still exposed to the virus, which means many nurses and doctors are coming to be positive with the COVID infection. Many don't even know they have the, 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 the infection. They were just exposed to someone who did and they are tested positive. Another fraction actually are sick with it, often mild symptoms. But because of the very high prevalence of the virus nowadays, you're not supposed to come to work 
if you have symptoms. And, and therefore, a lot of people that are doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers or the hospitals don't come to work. If you don't come to work, you can't run the hospital. So unlike last year, where it was very high volume of sick patients taking up a lot of resources from the hospital and therefore elective surgeries and elective procedures, non-urgent procedures were being canceled. This year, there's a little bit of that. So in our hospital, as, as well as other hospitals, we were having an increase in the volume, not like last year, but an increase in the volume of patients in the hospital that are also COVID positive. Most of them are not in the ICU. Most of them are not very sick, but they are taking up beds and resources. And those that are sick, uh, unfortunately, are typically also not vaccinated. So that's another issue we can talk about. But what's going on is now, in addition to like a bed issue, we also have a staffing issue because we don't have enough people available to staff every single resource for the hospital. And so again, similar to last year, but not as bad, we are either on a moratorium to not, to not add extra surgeries until they can catch up, or more recently, we are actually actively having cancellations. And if you watch, sorry, if you read the news, there are multiple hospitals. I just read Rochester, University of Rochester in New York, which is a major institution, they actually completely shut down their surgery center. It is completely shut down. And all of those workers that are left there are shifted to the hospital to allow for the uh, more important, more critically ill patients in the hospital to be taken care of. That's unheard of to have a surgery center just completely shut down. Um, and, and there's other stories like that throughout the nation. So my operations that were scheduled this year are canceled. I haven't heard about next week, but it's possible that those will also get canceled. And these, I have to like beg and plead for some patients because they're, though we scheduled them electively, they're not actually elective. Like in, I have a patient with a mesh infection that I'll be operating on. Um, and uh, uh, I was assured that will be, be canceled because that's technically not elective surgery. But it's hard because you're dealing with a lot of conflicting needs of patients. And I can't, uh, I always advocate for my own patients, but I can't in good conscience, you know, vouch for someone to have a hernia repaired, whether it's someone that has a cancer uh, or is critically ill and needs um, their heart attack addressed or whatever. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and therefore, I thought it would be a good time, even though maybe a little bit late, because we're a year and a half into, into the pandemic, to address the COVID pandemic, its future, and how it relates to hernia surgery. So currently, every person who undergoes any surgery, including hernia surgery, and this I believe is true for the entire United States, uh, must be tested for COVID, regardless of your vaccination status must be tested for COVID prior to undergoing surgery. Usually it's within 48 hours, although it's getting a little bit more difficult to get tested so quickly because of the demand. But it's usually within 48 hours you have to be tested. And if you're negative, then you can move forward and have your surgery. It used to be, the reason for that is if you don't know, if you're in the early stages of COVID, and you underwent surgery. We found this from China. The Chinese data really helped us out. Um, back in the early stages of COVID, the first stage of COVID, once you were infected, but didn't really know you were infected, and you underwent surgery, people that then became positive within a day or two of surgery, a large fraction of them died. And they died from massive inflammatory reactions, mostly in the lungs, and they had respiratory failure. Those types of variants are mostly gone. In the United States, we have Omicron, which is the primary variant. Delta is, is mostly um, uh, out and, and uh, in, in the minority of the variants. 
And from what we understand currently from Omicron, it doesn't live in the lungs, it lives in the nose and kind of upper pharynx uh, throat area, similar to the common cold, and therefore is less likely to cause severe respiratory failure or pulmonary failure like we're seeing in the early wave of the COVID um, pandemic. And therefore, theoretically, if you undergo surgery and you don't know you're COVID positive or it's early stages, you shouldn't die from the COVID, um, assuming you're also vaccinated, because it is as if you had surgery um, and had just a really bad influenza or cold um, in terms of like a risk of dying due to the exposure to surgery. Uh, that said, it's still a very lethal virus, about 10 times more lethal than the influenza virus. So even though it seems that the variants are getting weaker, they're still stronger in terms of lethality than what we commonly know about the influenza virus. About 10 times. So if you look at the current weekly deaths in the United States, it's about 150 or so on average per week, and that's increased. Um, uh, sorry, that's kind of remained stable lately. That said, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. If you look at the, week, the weekly United States deaths from the current COVID variants, it's about 1,500 deaths a week, 1,500 deaths a week. Whereas typically on an average year for influenza virus, it's about 150 per week. So about a tenth of that. So even though we're trying to get a control of the COVID virus, the coronavirus pandemic, less people are being hospitalized and less people are, are dying, it's still a pretty high death rate compared to what we're used to, which is why it's so important that everyone gets vaccinated so people stop dying um, and or uh, become hospitalized because of it. So. Currently, the status is you do need to be, um, they don't ask for vaccination status, but you do need to be tested for COVID regardless of vaccination status prior to undergoing any elective surgery. And the reason for that is not so much to prevent your death, although that is one of the reasons, but it's also to protect other people either in the hospital, the surgery center, other patients, as well as the anesthesiologist, the surgeon from getting sick because of your virus. Because like I said, the death rate is still about 10 times that of the influenza virus. Um, it seems that we are moving a little bit away from worrying about the positive positivity rate because like record numbers of people are being, are testing positive. But the majority of those, because about what is that? What did I say? Uh, four out of five are at least partially vaccinated and two thirds are vaccinated. The more majority of patients will not die, will not end up in the hospital, but may have a bad cold type symptoms. So that's the status with COVID. I don't know what's going to happen the next year. There have been a lot of very positive sounding um, predictions claiming that we're now moving from the pandemic stage to the endemic stage where pretty much everyone at some point will be exposed to the coronavirus and um, slowly we'll just kind of have that in our system. And although the variation, the variants will continue to progress, they will be weak. If you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, the virus, wants to live the same way we want to live. And the virus can only live if we live. So because it gets passed on from human to human. So the, the best way for the virus to live and grow is to infect each patient at a time, but not kill them. And in doing so, it'll spread and become more populous, um, but it'll be weaker than the original ones. If you think about Ebola, the Ebola virus was not a smart virus. It was very, very strong. It immediately killed everyone it touched. And so 
it couldn't survive in a population because their host, which was the patients, died and they, it couldn't be passed on. They died before the virus got passed on to a next series of patients. And so fortunately, that very deadly virus, and very um, contagious virus, um, eventually just kind of is no longer. So that's kind of the situation with coronavirus, which is at this point, from what we know with the Omicron, and the, again, I hope that everyone is very, very patient with this process. We as physicians and scientists are constantly in a learning situation. I say that as part of hernia talk. I always say, you know, we're talking about Asian syndrome or Schoenfeld syndrome or some type of allergic reaction, mesh implant illness. And, you know, um, we just don't know enough about it. So when I have patients with mesh implant illness and I discuss with them what I think it is, what I think the recommendations are and what I predict the outcome will be, it's with a great, it has to be taken with a great assault because we don't know. We don't know if um, every single patient with mesh implant illness will react to all meshes or all sutures um, or if they will be cured once the mesh is removed. In our experience, most of them are cured. In our experience, they're, uh, the majority are cured within days to weeks of the mesh being removed. And I will update you on my website if you guys follow me, uh, the publication of my paper. It will be the first paper ever um, describing mesh implant illness and the results of what happens when the mesh is removed. And after Dr. Trevert's paper um, that actually discusses the possibility of a mesh implant illness, mine's a second paper that actually tells you what happens when you do the mesh removal. So I'm super excited about that, but it's, it's being submitted for publication. And so um, I'll share with you tidbits, but once it's published, you guys can all read it. It'll be uh, highly informative, I hope. And the more of us that see this problem and treat it and publish about it, the more we can all learn um, and move on. So the same is true about the coronavirus. As far as we know, the current, the current wave is more endemic. So we, there's been discussions about talking mostly about hospitalizations and death rates and not so much the pure sheer numbers of positivity because um, that has not yet been, um, what do you call it? Uh, believe that's true, had a history of either autoimmune disorder themselves or some type of autoimmune, uh, about 40% uh, had a history of autoimmune disorder themselves or, or, history, or family history, whereas patients without mesh implant illness uh, had that problem, about half of them. And then uh, we also report on the different types of meshes to which they had the implant illness. It, it was all different types, polypropylene, polyester, um, uh, biologic meshes, hybrid mesh, uh, meshes, as well as polyester suture, sorry, uh, polypropylene suture and polyester suture. So it's not just mesh necessarily. We don't really know if mesh implant illness is a volume issue. So the more you're exposed to the implant, larger implants, thicker implants, higher volume of implant, if that's what sparks it, or is it an intrinsic immunity, autoimmune reaction to the product itself because of your own either sensitivities or exposures, there's some thought that we're seeing much more mesh implant illness in the developed English speaking worlds because we are already exposed to much more um, uh, plastics and other kind of uh, synthetic products 
and therefore we're already somewhat sensitized and when you put that inside our body then we react to it it's a theory uh, i'm not sure it's true but the top three countries that report uh, mesh implant illness are number one united states number two united kingdom number three australia number four south south africa so is that just a coincidence? Is it because we don't really read non-English <laughs> journals? Uh, are the other countries not really paying much attention to this? Like India has over a billion patients. So you would think even if it were one-tenth of a percent of patients, that would be a large number of patients. I just don't know that. Um, there's some thought that even the chronic, even chronic pain is not an issue. Chronic pain is not a problem. Um, it is a problem, but it's not as dramatic a problem after hernia repair in India as it is in the United States. So even if they did millions and millions of surgery, it's much more than for the United States. Even if 0.1% of those people uh, have a problem, you would think that would be a large number, and yet it's not. And it, there's some discussion about cultural differences in complaints and pain perception and uh, physician physicians addressing patients' needs in different cultures. And that maybe in the United States, there's more, how should I frame this without sounding horrible? <laughs> they complain more. <laughs> Patients maybe complain more or expect a more perfect outcome from their operations, whereas people in, in less developed countries tend to be much more kind of, I don't want to use the word appreciative, maybe much more forgiving of outcomes from their, their doctors. And they, the physicians and surgeons have a much higher level of Kind of hierarchy in the in the cultures and so they tend not to question as much maybe that's why the patients would rather suffer than kind of tell their surgeon like why do i have testicular pain now you know so that may be um, part of the problem just want to round out this discussion about coronavirus and surgery talking about testing so the more variants come up, the more important it is to have a very a highly sensitive test. And with time, we've learned that PCR testing is the best. There's uh, typically PCR testing you get it done at most, most pharmacies. Um, there's also the at-home test, which is called the antigen test that has been shown to be less and less sensitive and more false negatives than the PCR test as more variants are come about. So the rapid tests and the antigen tests are not as, sorry, the rapid antigen tests and the at-home antigen tests are not as sensitive and are more likely to have a high false negative rate. And the PCR test is cur currently, the nasal swaps, currently the gold standard. And also what you need for travel, et cetera. And then lastly, the PCR test can be done rapid, but that's very expensive. And I believe that's not covered by most insurances. Very expensive. But typical PCR test, there is a law now that must be covered by insurances, at least in the California. I don't know if it's a federal law. If anyone knows the answer to that, you can let me know. All right, so a couple of questions have been sent to me um, through my different social media. So I do highly encourage that you send me questions. Uh, so for the next half of the hour, we'll go through your different questions. One of them is about uh, umbilical hernias and whether, um, whether you should lose weight. So the question uh, is this, specifically it's asking about um, Let's share some screen for those of you that are online. So should I wait to lose, should I wait, W-A-I-T, to lose weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, for an umbilical hernia? The answer is yes. Every hernia surgery will do better if you're not overweight and you're not obese. In fact, there's a cutoff at a 
BMI or body mass index of 40 kilograms per meter squared, which means you're at least uh, 100 or so pounds overweight, uh, you should not have any hernia surgery. If you want to have any surgery, it should be weight loss surgery before you attempt any elective hernia surgery. The problem is this, and I have a couple patients out there that have seen me who I love and they're amazing people and they're hundreds of pounds overweight and I beg them for their own health, but also for their hernia health to lose the weight and I beg them to get weight loss surgery. It's nearly impossible to lose a couple hundred pounds on your own. You need help. That help is almost surgical. In some situations, you have to hire someone, either a physician or a trainer to get you down, but there, it's really, really, really difficult to, to lose that much weight in a reasonable time um, on your own. So weight loss surgery is really the only method to move forward. We've had two surgeons, I believe so far that have come on board. We talked about weight loss surgery with Dr. Green. Do I have Dr. Greenberg? Um, and Dr. Bittner. I don't know if they haven't had Dr. Greenberg, it's time for him to come on board. <laughs> uh, he's currently in Georgia. So, Yes, you need to lose weight. Please consider weight loss surgery. There is a little bit of a stigma against getting surgery for weight loss. I hope you all understand most of these people that you see that are famous, whether they're politicians or actors or singers, that all of a sudden lost a lot of weight, 90 pounds in, in several months or 100 pounds or 60 pounds within a year. That's all weight loss surgery. They're not telling you they're having weight loss surgery. I'm willing to bet, bet money. And I know many of them for a fact, because I live in a city where these are all done, had weight loss surgery. It's just not public knowledge. So I don't know why they don't just come out and say, yeah, you know, I tried for decades to lose my weight and I can't lose the weight and I did weight loss surgery because that stigma needs to go. Patients with, who undergo weight loss surgery have a higher life expectancy, less risk of needing hip replacements and knee replacements, less risk of heart disease, less breast cancer risk, less colon cancer risk. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And most recently, there's a paper that came out and looked at not only the fact that overweight people are more likely to be sicker, and or die from COVID, from the coronavirus. But the minute you have weight loss surgery, you re reduce your risk of hospitalization and death from COVID. The minute you have surgery, you don't even have to lose 100 pounds. So this is really, really important. Please consider weight loss surgery if you're about 100 or so pounds more, or if you just haven't been able to bring it down. And if you are someone with a really huge hernia, I have a lot of patients waiting for surgery. I haven't offered it to them yet because I need them to lose the weight. It's going to be really hard with a big hernia to also be active enough to lose the weight in addition to changing your diet. And so what I need you to do is to get the weight loss surgery to help you get there faster. Even if you do diet and exercise, it's going to take years with a weight loss surgery much faster, and then you can have your hernia surgery, but I would not recommend hernia surgery when you are obese. Next question. Can you please speak to incisional hernia, uh, sorry, incisional healing? I had an abdominal wall reconstruction and hernia repair December 2nd, 2021. I'm having four areas that continue to seep. Oh, interesting. Abdominal wall reconstruction, okay. I was told today it is due to so many abdominal surgeries and this happens. Can you tell me if they should be covered, left out to air or put anything on them? Very, very good question. I'm very happy to answer that. It's an excellent question. So in general, you should heal wounds. If you're not healing wounds, something is wrong. Often it's because your nutrition is not good. So anyone who undergoes surgery should 
eat and drink a lot of protein. You start drink, 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 drink protein shakes, your wound will heal. So that's number one. So if you need to help with your wound healing, drink and add protein to your diet. Number two, if you're diabetic or have a tendency to high sugars, make sure your diabetes is well controlled during surgery and after surgery because the blood sugar being high will prevent blood, um, wound healing at a rate that is acceptable. That's number two. The rest of it has to do with your surgeon or your surgery and what was done. So if you had a lot of skin removed or a lot of muscles moved around, that can affect the blood supply to your skin and muscle. And therefore, part of that edges of the wound may not get the best blood flow because it's the furthest away from everything else you've done, from where the blood vessels originate. So if you see any black in the skin or sloughing off like a layers of skin kind of sloughing off, that can be a sign you're not getting good blood flow to your wound. There's not much you can do with that. There are some people that take you to um, uh, uh, high, what's it called? I want to say bariatric oxygen, but it's not. <laughs> the oxygen chambers, they put you in the high uh, pressure oxygen chambers and that tends to push blood flow out further so that you can get better healing. The other uh, option are there are special creams that can help increase blood flow and decrease bacterial load. And in doing so, um, it can help your healing. So things like sylvidine cream, which is a prescription-based, sulfa-based cream. If you're not sulfa allergic, you can use hyperbaric. Thank you, thank you, Maida. <laughs> I love that you're watching this. Thank you. Hyperbaric oxygen uh, chamber, not bariatric. <laughs> Couldn't remember. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Um, yeah, hyperbaric chamber. Uh, Sylvanine, which is a sulfur based cream, is very good at promoting healing and reducing the back by reducing the bacterial load in the area. In general, if your wound is not healing and it's open and it's seeping. First, see what it's seeping. If it's more like a yellowish tinged or sometimes yellowish brownish tinge, that's okay. It just is what your skin and fat start seeping. If it's green, that's not okay. If it's thick tan color, also not okay. That's a sign of an infection and needs to be addressed surgically. If your skin and soft tissue is not healthy, that's going to die and then bacteria loves to eat that dead tissue and so your risk of infection is higher. So assuming it's not infected, the best is to keep the wound moist. And what do we mean by moist? Not water, but the same way you moisturize your skin. So you should keep it moist. I like to use either one of two options, either uh, kind of over-the-counter uh, cream like a Cetaphil, Cetaphil cream or uh, prescription sylvanine cream. So those are really good to put over. Aloe is also good, it can keep it moist. So that's what we mean by moist and moist and covered. So you put a, a clean, dry gauze or other type of dressing over it and daily clean the wound. And by cleaning, you can do soap and water. That's totally okay. Soap and water is a great antibacterial. And then you dry it, and you put a nice layer of cream on it, either the um, prescription sylvanine cream only on the open area or like a, a set of fill over the counter cream. And that should work, work just fine. Um, there's another one too. I'm, I'm trying to remember, starts with an A. That's also a good, um, good skin. Uh, kind of cream. A lot of the plastic surgeons use it. Uh, if anyone remembers the term, it starts with an A. It's just an over the counter cream. Um, yeah, do not leave it open to air. Uh, 
if it's aquaphor thank you i love you guys <laughs> yes aquaphor aquaphor is great um uh, it's very watery like aquaphor and so it does keep it moist it's all it's not antibacterial in any way uh, so don't expect it to kill any bacteria but it does keep the wood moist as it's healing and also very good for lips yes correct <laughs> very funny love you guys uh yeah leaving wounds open to air while they're trying to heal it just dries out and dried doesn't work very well it's like putting your bread out you know you want it covered and kept moist otherwise it'll get not as tasty so very very good questions next question at 65 i have my first femoral hernia with a bowel loop and i'm really scared because it sounds like i can only have a mesh repair this is true i want a tissue repair not the best i'm a five foot eight 150 pound female, the hernia is four by 11 millimeters at the neck, and the sac is 55, but yeah, we don't care about the sac. Will a tissue repair have a 50-50 chance of holding? If not, which is the best of the worst meshes? Two surgeons in Montreal want to use a plug. Oh no, but I know what you think of those. Yeah, okay, so here's my thought on femoral hernias. Excellent question, another excellent question. So femoral hernias, uh, can be tissue repair. It's called a McVeigh repair, or Shouldice has a, a femoral hernia uh, variant uh, that was described. So there's a, a femoral hernia variant of Shouldice, but more commonly, there's also the McVeigh repair. Those tissue repairs are both not good. Yes, it's better than 50 50, but not by much. And in addition, because it's such a high tension repair, it causes a lot of pain in the area. So chronic pain after tissue repair for femoral hernia is a significant problem. Number one, for sure it's a femoral hernia, you have to get it repaired and there's bowel involved. So 100% you have to get it repaired and don't delay it because the more you delay, the more likely you are to end up in the emergency room and needing emergency surgery and then who knows who your surgeon will be and what, what options are even available to you by then. So if you um, are in Montreal, okay. So the gold standard is not a plug repair. In fact, we're moving away from plugs. The reason why we're moving away from plugs is the plugs that are used for um, femoral hernias, by definition, will be stuck against the femoral vein. And that is not a good place to have mesh. Number one, it could cause vein obstruction. Um, number two, it's a very bulky thing to put right where your groin crease is. And so if you're thin, you're not thin, you're, you seem to be average body weight, but in thin patients, if you move your, if you bend at your hip or move your legs and you have um, this, Full, thick thing right in the groin crease that can cause pain and prevent you from doing a lot of activities. So absolutely do not, if you have a choice, do not choose the mesh plug. Laparoscopic repair with mesh is absolutely the gold standard. It's an excellent repair. It has the lowest risk of chronic pain, the fastest recovery, and the lowest risk of recurrence if done by a surgeon. You have excellent surgeons in Montreal that can offer you at McGill can offer you a laparoscopic repair. Go see Dr. Vasiliou. She's uh, Melina Vasiliou. She's an excellent laparoscopic surgeon and she should be able to repair you uh, laparoscopically with mesh. I don't recommend the tissue repair, especially since you're not super thin. So the chance of you having a recurrence and chronic pain is significantly higher. So if you're worried about mesh because of chronic pain and other issues, then do not, um, do not choose the tissue repair. In fact, the mesh repair is the gold standard. So I hope that's helpful to you. All right, so what's the more questions? Um, how long after inguinal mesh removal should you know what kind of, where, oh, should you know kind of where you'll be for the long-term outcome? Good question. 
So it depends on how long you've been in pain and what your kind of pain threshold status is and what was done. And if it was done open or laparoscopic and if nerves have to be cut. Also, why was a mesh removed? Was it due to chronic pain or mesh reaction? Was it a meshoma um, or not? So in general, most people should feel different after the mesh removal almost immediately. They should have pain, but they can tell you, I have pain, but it's different than the pain from before surgery. That's a good sign. It will take weeks to months for you to feel back to normal, but you should feel looser in the area, less um, pulling and tugging. There will be swelling and bruising once that's gone, which can take four to six weeks, then you'll start uh, feeling better. So it is not necessarily immediate, depending on the reason for the mesh removal, but you should definitely feel different after surgery. Next question, what's the current situation with non-emergent surgeries happening at Cedar sinai with the current COVID spike? If you need a non-emergent surgery, but surgery would be better happening sooner rather than later, is it within the best interest of the patient to wait a few weeks if possible? Nice question. So at currently Cedar sinai up until last week, had a moratorium on scheduling new cases that are elective and non-emergent and non-urgent. That policy changed this month, this Sunday. They're actually actively canceling patients because of the spike in hospitalizations and the dramatic number of staff that are um, unable to work because they are symptomatic from COVID. So <clears throat> based on that, um, we are not scheduling. The question, second question is, and, and I explained earlier today at the onset of the um, hour that my patients have all, this week I'm not operating uh, at the hospital. They all got canceled. Um, the second part of the question is also important, which is if you want hernia surgery, should you have surgery during this pandemic? And I would say yes. I don't believe that um, the current pandemic is affecting patients who need elective surgery. Uh, you will all have to be tested for your COVID within two days of the operation. You must um, be negative for that. And fortunately, the current variant is such that even if you do get it, um, it does not cause inflammation of your lungs like the previous variants had. And so the chances of you having a horrible outcome after surgery, because now there's like COVID in your lungs is very, very low. So most of the hospitals are doing an excellent job of, of keeping um, patients safe. Uh, we're not having patient to patient transfer of, of uh, diseases. It's uh, everyone is very good at wearing their masks and, and following appropriate precautions with hand washing and alcohol. What's changed in the operating room is another question. Uh, is this, um, we're much more cognizant about the respiratory uh, issues. And so early on, we could not even be in the room uh, when the patient was being intubated by the patient, by the anesthesiologist, whereas now we are in the room. Um, we all wear masks, uh, but some people now wear like more of an N95 mask, uh, whereas before we were not wearing N95 masks. Um, the sanitation uh, has significantly increased and become more prolonged than before in the operating rooms. Um, still to this day, we're not allowing extra visitors in the room. So it used to be that you can have medical students, and visiting surgeons from other countries and um, reps from the industry in the rooms. That's pretty much no longer allowed. So we're limiting the number of people in the room. So I cannot take my residents to certain surgery centers because of those regulations. Um, I do those operations alone without a resident help. And I have a couple, I have two countries where they want, the surgeons have been asking to come to observe me doing certain types of operations they'd like to learn from me, um, which I'm happy to have and Cedar Sinai in the hospital is happy to have, but not right now, <laughs> unfortunately, um, because of the 
the um, COVID pandemic, we are now allowing any visiting surgeons, for, especially from other countries, um, actually from anywhere, uh, to come into uh, the hot, the operating room to kind of observe because we're limiting the volume and number of people that are available in the operating room and putting patients at risk. All right, back to more questions. How can you tell if your hernia is back if you have a mesh? Um, yeah, these are really insightful questions. So your question is right in that it's implying that a hernia recurrence after mesh repair is going to look and feel different than a hernia repair prior to than a hernia prior to mesh uh, uh, any hernia repair, because now you have mesh and scar tissue over the area where you're going to have a hernia recur. So before, when you had a hernia, whatever is going through, whether it's fat or intestine, will kind of eke its way through tissues, maybe push on the tissues, expand on the tissues. You may see a bulging. Those are all typical symptoms of a, a groin hernia or an abdominal wall hernia. If you add mesh, First of all, you've had surgery, so you're going to have scar tissue, and then you have mesh, which is like a covering over it. And so that's gonna be different in your sensation. You may or may not see a bulge. You will be pulling on the mesh potentially as things are trying to eke their way through uh, the hole. I just had a patient uh, this week that had, just a, had a tear of their mesh off of one of the sutures so that made an unstable repair. And so part of the mesh is flapping in the wind. And then because of that, it's no longer adequately covering the hernia. And then over time, he started having fat eek back into the hernia, but the symptoms were different than before surgery. Obviously, if the symptoms are same, then that's pretty clear cut. But many times the symptoms are different because now you're pushing into a tighter area that has scar tissue, the nerves are around, so if you're pulling on the mesh, you may be pulling on nerves, whereas before the nerves were not, were not an issue. So you may get more nerve type pain, you may get sharper pain as opposed to dull pain. And it may be more difficult to diagnose because on examination, there's no bulging and it's covered with scar and with the mesh. Whereas imaging is much, much more helpful in those patients. So in patients like you, um, that's not obvious, imaging is super helpful. And this patient that I'm talking about Unfortunately, his imaging was misinterpreted, but when I read it, I could see that like the mesh would be supposed to be flat, but in him, right where his pain was, the mesh just pulled away just slightly, like ever so slightly, just pulled away a little bit. And that was enough to give him uh, pain because it's, he's trying to recur through the, the hernia mesh. So that's why it's so important to not only get the right imaging, but also have that imaging appropriately reviewed because for whatever reason people um well let me tell you this i kind of cheat because i as a surgeon see you and examine you and then look at the imaging so i kind of already have an idea of what i'm look what i will plan to see and i've also reviewed prior operative reports for example so i know what's in your what's been done and so then I look at the imaging with so much more information, most radiologists do not interview their patients prior to surgery and aren't aware of the different types of mesh, different types of hernia repairs, and have no understanding of what the patient's pain is or where their pain is. And so they cannot correlate what they know from the patient and their history with the, with the imaging. So they're just going to read what they see. And like art, uh, radiology, you can, two people can see this, see the same thing, sorry, look at the same image and have a different interpretation. Uh, and if you talk to the radiologist, which I have, they're like, you know, you can say all this stuff because you, you interpret the imaging, understanding what's going on behind the scenes. So, we may be getting an imaging for a patient with appendicitis. And you're gonna say, well, look at that hernia there. Well, yeah, except 
everyone has maybe a little bit of fat. How do we know that that's a hernia that's symptomatic or not? Or if their right lower quadrant pain, let's say, is from the appendix, appendix. And so do you want us as radiologists really to tell you every single little piece of fat that we see anywhere that could potentially be a hernia? That's going to dramatic, dramatically increase the number of hernias we diagnose and potentially expose a much larger number of patients to unnecessary hernia surgery because unfortunately, there are plenty of surgeons out there that offer hernia surgery to completely asymptomatic patients. And as you know, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in uh, operating on every single hernia. We used to do that. And now we are stuck with a very high uh, chronic pain rate, which potentially could be lower if we only operate on patients that truly needed their hernia repair based on their symptoms. And, that, and if that means delaying your surgery by a couple of years until you become symptomatic, that's what I recommend. I know a lot of surgeons don't agree with me. They interpret the watchful waiting trial, which was done in 2006. They interpret the watchful waiting trial as, not as it's safe not to operate, but look at all these people that all end up needing surgery, about 70, 80% need surgery within five to 10 years. So why not just do the surgery now? Well, I'll tell you why, because you don't know who those 70, 80% are. And so you're, you're put, putting 20 to 30% of the people at risk for chronic pain from hurting your parents or a complication or nerve injury or, or, or mesh infection or something where they never needed it. So to me, that is not how I practice. Um, but it's very possible that if the radiologist reports every single little piece of um, hernia anywhere, that that will trigger the referring doctor to be like, oh, hernia, go to surgeon. Surgeon will be like, oh, hernia, go to surgery. And then you may never have to get it. I have plenty of patients that have come to me with, I just had testicular pain and or a growing pain, and I went to the surgeon, he said, I have a hernia, and I fixed it. I'm like, yeah, but none of your symptoms sounded like hernia symptoms. It sounded like a hip, or it sounded like a testicular problem. Like, yeah, but now they have a complication for the hernia repair. And by the way, since the hernia wasn't causing the symptoms, now they have still the symptoms from before surgery, which was the hip or the testicular problem. So. My point is this, uh, I don't believe, it's kind of a problem in that, are you over, I don't want radiologists necessarily to overdiagnose hernias either, because that will lead to over treatment as well. And so that's kind of a problem. Next question, is TEP, T-E-P, which is totally extraperineal, is tap placed mesh easier to remove than tap placed? No, tap and tap mesh are placed in the exact same position. And they just get to it differently, but it's in the same exact position. So no, the removal of tap versus tap is exactly the same. And by the way, removal of tap and tap is both done versus, uh, via tap, transabdominal preperineal. Does the genital femoral nerve always have to be cut when removing ingual mesh? Almost never, almost never, uh, to relieve ongoing chronic pain. It's not easy to injure the genital femoral nerve, not by repairing a hernia and not by removing the mesh uh, for laparoscopic surgery. And the reason for that is the, the nerve though it's nearby, it's actually underneath this kind of sheath uh, and often not kind of floating in the wind and open to being injured. So you really have to be very deep where the mesh has to dig very deep um, for the general femoral nerve to be injured and therefore need to be cut. So no, I almost never have to touch the general femoral nerve during inguinal mesh removal after the mesh was placed laparoscopically versus in a tap or a tap. So I hope that's helpful. Next question. What is the best test to find out if you have a hernia? Depends on the type of hernia. For the abdominal wall, CAT scan or ultrasound are both good. 
for the groin, an MRI or ultrasound are excellent, are both excellent. And CAT scan is not as good. It would be a second or third grade uh, for me. Uh, the reason why ultrasound and MRI are better is because they are much more sensitive and you can differentiate hernias from other things much better, whereas CAT scan everything that looks gray. But for the abdominal wall, the anatomy is more flat and not as curved as the pelvis. And so it's a little bit easier to identify hernias. And if you drink oral contrast, that can differentiate bowel from the abdominal wall. And uh, it's often difficult to get a good MRI image on the abdominal wall. So that's kind of how it goes. Um, the last thing I'd like to kind of end this hour with is um, I hope that all of you are safe and uh, COVID free or and staying safe. Um, I have a feeling that over the next two weeks, uh, some reports that by, by kind of mid February, this surge is going to reduce. And uh, that's based on UK and Israel data that shows that the Omicron kind of pandemic uh, has is very short lived. It kind of spikes and then comes down, goes up really fast and comes down really fast. And so I'm hoping that not only will all of you be safe because there'll be less of a prevalence of this variant, but also the hospitals will open up and that we can provide care again. I'm very fortunate that our surgery center um, is open and has been open and providing excellent care to everyone who cannot get care at the hospital. And the hospital is actively transferring as many patients to the surgery center for their care as possible to offload the hospital. So Cedar Science did an excellent job. And for those of you who visited me, I have a very beautiful office in Beverly Hills in the best building in Beverly Hills. Um, it's A plus rated, I don't know what that means, but it is a great building. <laughs> uh, high security and very clean. And we have two surgery centers in this building. I'm very happy to announce that our surgery center was voted number two in the nation in all of the United States. We were number two for a surgery center. Um, it's a Cedar Sinai a partially owned you know, surgery center that we share with. Um, for your reference, number one UCLA is outpatient surgery center. So the top two surgery centers in the nation outpatient are in Los Angeles. So that's pretty cool. Although technically, or in Beverly Hills, but LA County, Los Angeles County. Um, and we just give really excellent care. Uh, many people that I know and love have had surgery here and uh, it's just very well done, very well run. And they have been a godsend and a savior uh, for my patients and others who, who are being canceled at the hospital. Um, question here is if you've had COVID, how long should you wait before considering surgery? Depends on the variant. So back in the early stages, I believe the recommendation was eight weeks before you should have surgery. That is no longer the case. Currently, as long as you're COVID negative, um, you, should, you are allowed to have surgery because the current variant, which is Omicron variant, resides in the nose and upper pharynx and not in the lungs. And so your risk of having surgery um, while still recovering from your infection is much, much lower because the lungs are not um, affected. So I believe the answer is five to 10 days. Uh, that said, you're, you may still be positive on your COVID testing and therefore you have to get antibody tested, um, not just uh, PCR tested. If you're PCR positive, but five to 10 days has gone by, um, you should probably get antibody testing because uh, you may be falsely positive after you're no longer infectious from the, um, the COVID testing. So it's been fun. Um, I'm super excited about this year. I feel that it's going to be brighter, lighter, uh, less depressing. I'll do more operations. I'll continue with my hernia talk. 
you guys will you guys will all be very much safer and healthier and um you know i'm planning on going on a lot of trips on for meetings and so on i have a lot of meetings coming up which i will share with all of you uh so i will see you next week uh this ends it for me hernia talk live q a with dr sharin tofai thanks for everyone for coming in on zoom and facebook live and do like and share from my YouTube channel. I want more people to go on my YouTube channel as I'm filling it up for you. So thanks everyone. Peace out.